And if you can't hear me, just let, just let me know. <laughs> um, welcome everyone to um, this artist talk with Vanessa Dion Fletcher, um, whose exhibition we're standing in, uh, Relative Gradient. We're really lucky to have Vanessa here. Um, I just wanted to start off with a short intro to Vanessa and then I'll acknowledge and then I'll pass it over so we can start our tour. So the town of Wisher so well acknowledges uh, this land is the treaty territory of the Williams Nations. It is also traditional ter territory of other Anishinaabe peoples, including Huron Wendat and Haudenosaunee. We also recognize the contributions uh, of all Indigenous peoples to this place and commit to a continued dialogue and greater respect for the land we have come to share. This recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise uh, and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. So this is Vanessa. I'm sure some of you have met her before, but um, allow me to do the official bio. Vanessa is a Lenape and Potawatomi neurodiverse artist based in Toronto. She graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2016 with an MFA in performance and a Bachelor of Fine Art from York University in uh, 2009. She's exhibited across Canada and the USA at Art Mirror Montreal, Eastern Edge Gallery in Newfoundland, the Queer Arts Festival in Vancouver, and the Satellite Art Show in Miami. Her work is in the Indigenous Art Center, John Flash Arts Book Collection, VTape, Seneca College, Global Affairs Canada, and the Archives of American Art. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to Vanessa to start the tour. Thank you. Uh, so that's my introduction in the Lenape language. Um, as I just say it after my, my art introduction. And I should say, yeah, there are two really important parts of who I am, my art practice, my professional life, um, and my indigenous language and community. Um, and uh, yeah, I carry both things with me everywhere I go. And this exhibition um, also really brings those two things together, looking at uh, quilt work, which is a practice that has been an art form that's been done, um, made by indigenous people, um, probably since there were porcupines and people. <laughs> um, and yeah, so thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to uh, the Williams Nations and um, you know to all the people who've taken care of this land and place. Um, and I'm really happy to be back in Stoke for the evening. So starting over here, I've um, got a whole series of two-dimensional artwork. Um, and um, um, so these are all the, the quills that are soaked in water um, and then sewn onto uh, paper. So sewn onto the surface of paper. Um, and in my undergrad at York, I studied some print making and I learned a lot about paper through that process and really um, love paper um, in the lab at Camp Beal. Um, so uh, yeah, when I started working with porcupine quills many years later in 2017, um, I usually this method would be done on um, like on a hide or a leather. Um, I was doing it for my apartment in Toronto and I did not have any. <laughs> um, but I had a lot of paper around. Um, and I knew from other artists like Nadia Meyer and um, Jim, um, Jim Barry Ace. Um, those are both artists who have done big work on paper. So I figured why not do full work on paper. Um, and yes, yeah, so I ended up really, from my early, even just learning the process, doing it on paper. Um, and now I find it hard to work on anything else. Um, even though in some ways it's very unforgiving. Um, but yeah, it's really kind of become what I've been 
things too. And I don't know what else about the paper. Yeah, people are often surprised by the um, like the crispness, I guess, of it, of the paper, and like the process of, of sewing into the paper. So the clothes are placed on top of them, are sewn, like, as I said, onto the surface of the paper. Um, this is like a cotton rag paper. Um, and yeah, it holds up, it holds up really well. And I can only see the exact holes that I'm sewing through. Um, and I really like the, yeah, the beautiful surface of and that like crisp, even surface of the paper. Um, and the, yeah, the way the quills, even though they're flat two-dimensional works, um, I agree when you get either looking really close or when you look at some of the enlarged photographs, you can start to see um, all the dimension in the work. Um, and again, looking close, another thing um, people are often really surprised by is how reflective and shiny they are, um, and that it's just the quality of the quills themselves. Um, what should I say? So they're dyed many different colors. Um, I use natural and synthetic dyes. Um, and um, a lot of the natural dyes, in part because um, I'm a novice natural dyer, <laughs> um, and in part because I'm just um, falling in love with like a softer, uh, more subtle color with the natural dyes, and then you kind of lean into um, that world of color um, and kind of just have like smaller moments of the more um, like fully saturated or darker or brighter colors. Um, yeah, some color, paper, surface, I guess we can talk about form. Um, when I started working with quills, like really just, you know, literally trying to wrap my fingers around them. Um, I started making straight lines, uh, very much like that work on the end of there, right? It's like mm -hmm. one straight line, um, and it's, just, it's a lot easier to work with, holding the pills back and forth, all lined up. Um, and as I kind of gained confidence, I started to make different shapes, um, and, and so I learned how to work. Um, from a woman named Brenda Lee, who is Cree, and she was living on the Nipissing First Nation. Um, so I spent a weekend with her um, and the first day was um, practicing the clothes from a porcupine. So she had a um, steep porcupine up off the road. That's how most people um, get their clothes, is from porcupines that have um, been hit by cars. And, um, yeah, we, so we spent the whole first day pulling the quills out of the porcupine. She covers them with ash from a wood stove, and that helps pull the um, cut the quilt come out more easily. Um, and then, yeah, and then the second day, um, she showed me a bunch of different ways to stitch. And she also um, does like makes the like home can hides. So, we, so I learned like on a little piece of um, which are also like, much softer than commercially hand heights. Um, and you can also use, you can also do around, like a beading foundation, uh, like a piece of felt, lots of different, different options. Um, so process, learning, form. Um, so I made a lot of straight lines <laughs> and then um, I wanted to make a circle. Um, and I tried kind of making some pretty really small circles, and what happens is your quills get all bunched up, and then because the outside is a much greater distance than the inside, um, it can be very frustrating. So from there, I thought, what if I make a really, really, really gentle curve, um, and it's like one big circle. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I ended up making actually the images of this. Well, the back was originally done um, on a piece of paper that was this size. So the original core was about six inches um, tall. So again, it's like a nice, gentle slope. <laughs> um, 
bag as big as you. Um, so it's so much bigger than its original form, um, but it also, you know, it is not 10 feet tall or 20 feet tall, right, where it starts to kind of roll over us. It's really something where you relate to it with your body. Um, and yeah, so the version of the park was made of plywood with vinyl and stuck to um, the front and the two kind of faces. Um, and once I um, was able to see it in space, I really, really loved it. And I love the way it frames. It kind of acts as, it's, as a frame in itself, right? Whatever you're looking through, you see both the work and then like, what's behind it. Um, yeah, so this is the work that was behind it, and, um, the, um, right, but I didn't, um, I hadn't thought about, like, this inside part, um, and the outside part, I just thought of it as the two pieces, but once I thought the work in three dimensions, I really wanted to fill those parts in, um, make it more of a whole three-dimensional object, and I wanted to make it, um, more scary. Um, the plywood stood up pretty well, but didn't make it through the winter. Um, so this one, I was able to work with a sculptor named Matthew Walker, um, and he welded a frame. Um, and then we had the image printed on dye bond, which is the same material we used for signs, like um, traffic signs and test signs, and um, all of those kinds of signs. So you can print it in like full color and it's really beautiful and it's like the quilt shiny and reflective. Um, and it's yeah, playable enough to kind of like curve on the inside. Yeah. It feels three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. It actually you can feel like you can touch it, you can feel the texture, so it's really really nice and yeah. Um and some other just like I guess other things but uh, we designed it so that it's made in two parts. Um, and it can also be displayed that way. So it can be taken apart and displayed um, as like two arches or two rainbows or smiley faces. Um, yeah, it can be turned in different, different directions. Um, and here it's on the ground with the post post, but it can also be, it can also be like put out on post so it is in the video. I think, I think, um... If I had ever encountered this, like stumbled across this performance, um, I would stay for the whole thing because as you watch, you know, watching Vanessa, like I'll, I'll, I guess I'll let you explain it, but you know, watching what you do with the the dyes, it's mesmerizing, and then once you get the sense of the rest of the work and the rest of the show, it sort of all comes together with this performance. This is uh, a little, let's call a little parquet. It's just like very small. Actually, what the city of Toronto kind of defines as leftover pieces of land or land that isn't um, really commercially viable because either it's too small or there has to be, um, you know, maybe some little piece of infrastructure that is a, um, kind of, yeah, unusable for. Um, you know, development or commercial purposes. Um, and this, this was part of a series called the Parkettes Project, where a curator, um, Shane Parsons, invited artists to create public works um, in these parks. And um, yeah, as Chloe was mentioning, I didn't I really like I didn't advertise the performance, so um, it's in this public space, and um, just. Um, I had invited a few friends and colleagues and then um, whomever was um, yeah, around at the park to, um, to kind of happen to watch. Um, and I chose this park in particular because it's surrounded by um, high-rise residential buildings, apartment buildings. Um, so I liked that it was um, really densely populated in terms of the people who um, would potentially pass by and, and see it on a daily basis. Would you mind just 
describing what like the action that you're doing and then something down there. Mm -hmm. um, the um, so we've hung um, kind of bases of um, dye that are used in the um, to dye the quills in this piece. Um, so, yeah, the same dye um, is in poured into these vessels that are hanging off the sculpture, um, and they're dripping um, out of them onto um, this garment and on, onto my.
uh, or not bouncing from maybe letting one medium influence how you work with another medium and then going back and forth, how that sort of works in your practice. When I started um, making the quilt, the quilt work, the first thing I did was uh, embroidered sheets on paper and embroidered lines on paper. And um, I didn't feel like it was um, enough. Um, that like a plan on quilt work, like, something about it, um, didn't, it couldn't stand on its own. Um, but I had to add different things to it. And um, I had really supportive uh, colleagues um, who came and looked at the work and, you know, I was like kind of floating all these different ideas about how to work with it in performance and, um, you know, something to write on them, or, like collage, or, like all these things. I was like, don't worry, there's going to be more. <laughs> um, and what everybody told me was that they were beautiful and wonderful and in themselves, and I think that taking that, um, um, taking that to heart and um, showing and then showing these works, um, you know, the, the works on paper um, to different audiences and having them be really well received um, was a bit of a shift in my practice from having from making things um, before that really had. Um, kind of a message to them, you know, I could say, like, these are the, um, you know, top three, like, message points of the work, uh, maybe a little bit political or conceptual, but they were, just, you know, they were all, before they were all things that were, um, kind of had that motivation, um, so to make, uh, you know, lines on paper that were, you know, very subtle, different colors, um, I was very nervous about doing that and about how it would be received and like I said, like if that was um, a, um, a, enough, enough for the, a need for an audience um, and having that, again, be supported and be encouraged, I think really gave me um, a sense of confidence in um, uh, my studio practice and um, that yeah, to have a confidence in my practice and the way I was working, and um, yeah, to just to just keep going. And so now, for me, I think, um, yeah, I guess I'm not sure what is there. And I think, and then I also feel like there's a much larger trajectory of this work. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it's where that's headed. Um, that then it, it's really going to continue. And then the, um, the quill work um, has a kind of timeline in itself, um, especially working with natural dyes that only produce themselves so often. Um, like I said, like the blood roots, they're alive the whole year, um, but you can only identify them in the spring when they have their little white flowers after that. Um, they're pretty yeah, they're really hard to identify. And um, they're, they're like somewhat endangered plants, so you have to be really careful about how much you um, harvest. So it's not, you know, in that example, it's not widely available. Um, also, with like uh, black walnut, um, like produces different colors when the tree, like when the, um, the nuts are green versus when they drop to brown. Um, so a lot of those things are on like a yearly cycle, and all of these pieces start with um, harvesting the quills and washing them several times, um, and then sorting them by length and diameter. Um, so you kind of start with a mass of like thousands and thousands of quills, um, and then when I'm making the work, there's such attention paid to each individual one. This one's a slightly different diameter than the last one. Is it okay? Or like, oh, I really want one that's just the right color and it's going to fit right here. And that you 
goes down to their the quills are type of hair of the porcupine. Um, so it's right down to this individual hair. And I really am really um, like emotionally invested in um, that kind of detail um, and, and thought about um, such small objects and how this natural material. Um, yeah, the other thing that happens is that I can't, um, or I can only control it so much, and I only, um, and, I, and I choose to embrace that. Um, you can see lots of cool work, I absolutely encourage you to, um, you know, look at, look at like hashtag cool work on Instagram, or do a Google search, or see all the other cool works out there, because it's, uh, you know, you can think of it as painting, or, um, and drawing and uh, all the different styles and approaches that people take. Um, it's really vast. So um, I also see the work within that um, kind of um, community and development um, and whatever uh, people are doing. Um, yeah. I like I like how you were describing the process of um, your work from you know collecting the materials that you, you would use to tie the quilts to sorting and you know the emotional process of that and talking about your work in seasons like the flowers come into season you have to wait to collect them the process of sorting each hair that identifying and finding the right uh, quill for the right spot on the paper it just highlights and i think we sort of all got that we, we got this the, the slowness the intentional slowness of your work um, i'm wondering if you can touch on that um, that idea and the importance of that um, within your practice as a whole. Like I think when we watch that video um, that's on the back wall, that's just one, that's the process of putting one quill down. And it's not even the process of choosing it and you know clipping it and dyeing it, it's just laying it down onto the paper. So I'm wondering if you can chat about slowness and then chat about, um, I know that there's double meanings behind that word um, and I think that the really um, interesting and important points for the show. So, um, I think like in textile work, it's a really common um, uh, thing to talk about, right? Is the, the time that it takes, and um, my brain is constantly um, like I'm really amazed and um, in thinking about how. Um, yeah, the time that different things take to make and the time that, just I guess different experiences um, of that. So, um, it's faster now, but before, before I got an Apple Pencil, um, when I was using my mouse to edit these photos, um, it would take like days to um, edit the, like a, right, like a, um, uh, like edge each individual quill. Yeah. 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 So this right, this is this is originally on the curly paper. Mm -hmm. So it's just that piece over there. Um, and so I scanned it and then replaced the creamy paper with this black background. Um, and to get the edge looking like it does, and it like takes I like zoom in um, and until like one quill fills the whole screen and then choosing each pixel that I want <laughs> um, to erase. And so yeah, so that the like, digital process also can take a really long time. Um, and then you print the photo, which takes like 30 minutes. <laughs> um, and so there, yeah, there's a whole kind of movement, different movement um, time, classing and expanding. And um, it is one of my favorite things to do is like if ever I have or whenever I have um, what feels like free time, um, I go to my studio and I work on call work and it really is one of my favorite things to do. Um, so in that sense, it uh, is so enjoyable and goes by really quickly. Um, so slowness in itself, as I was talking um, about time and the process and describing, you know, all these things and, and using the word slow, it really hit me one day that I was like, oh, 
I know this word. I'm really familiar with it. Um, and it's from being in school and um, people talking about how slow my work was, right? Like to produce, be like, oh, it's, you're so slow at your multiplication tables. You're so slow at writing your essay. You're so slow at all of these things. Um, and then sometimes that gets translated into like a broader category of like pejorative, right? Somebody is slow. Um, I don't even, that could mean so many things, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so it got me thinking a lot more about when it is, um, you know, you think about it, right, in like a capital, capitalistic sense or, um, you know, in this like capitalist economy, somebody who is, find a slow part of that is in you know, relationship to their ability to produce um, whatever it is that the world wants them to make or get somewhere. Um, and am I going? Yeah. It is a, I didn't think of it like that, but it is a valuation like on a human being, which when we stop and think about that is a, a huge statement to me. And so when you're bringing in these, um, like the idea of slowness as absolutely necessary to create this type of work, to um, you know watch it expand and morph into different um, types of work, I think that there's a flipping that on its head and showing like the beauty of working slowly, of not um, moving in a linear way, like not thinking in a linear way, which if you think about you know the Western way of how we're taught to you know, read left to right, up and down, and not, you know, learn something front to back and then not go back to it, like move on to the next step. Um, that's not always helpful. That's not always like beneficial to the learner. <laughs> so I, I love how your work sort of undoes that in, in a, a few different ways. Yeah. yeah, and also I guess I also think about like all of the, like some of the different jobs that I've had. Um, I did uh, like professional childcare for a really long time. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, really from the time I was a teenager, um, uh, until I started teaching, um, in my early 30s, and so throughout, like, doing that, right, it also made me think a lot about, like, right, like, just the daily tasks of, like, taking care of ourselves and our world, um, uh, takes, takes a lot of time, um, there's a quote by a, like one of the famous MS 60 years artist whose name is Escape Me, um, which is it's a small, small world, but not if you have to clean it. Um, right, so there's so much, um, you know, painstaking time that gets taken, right, to take care of, um, you know, the little bodies of infants who are going to grow up to be us, um, you know, to the gallery space itself. Can I imagine how long it takes to clean the pool? Like, oh my God. Yeah. So as, as a sidebar, that's what they've been doing for the last two weeks. So we've got to watch them through this glass window. It's a lot. And there's not just one person that's like a couple people in there scrubbing, but anyway. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of things, a lot of things take a lot of time. And um, it's really a To, to put so much time in it. Another artist um, that I'm thinking of is uh, Andrew McVale, um, a Hamilton-based artist uh, who's HIV positive and does um, uh, work where um, embroidering the sequence on two different fabrics and does it by hand. Um, and part of the kind of conceptual thinking about that is like, within um, you know, the framework of illness, um, and you know the potential of having you know a potentially shorter lifetime. How do you choose to spend your time? Um, and what are the different kind of visual representations of um, uh, yeah of a life or of how one spends spends their their days? Um, I love how um, even just in that example, or uh, what we were talking about or when you brought up how when you have free time you go back to your studio and you're, you're making these things in your studio. 
Um, for me, it comes back to your body a lot, like the, you know, holding the embroideries in your hand. Um, there's a relationship to the body that feels uh, very intimate, like not only in scale, but also in the knowing of that, that process. Um, so there's that, but then when you expand the work and you transform it into something else, there's a different, a completely different relationship to the body. So, you know, relative saturation in the center of the room or these large scale photographs, they become, the, the relationship to the body changes drastically. So I'm wondering if you can touch on that and talk us through, you know, maybe it's an unconscious, maybe it's a very conscious thing, the relationship of your work and the bodies of people that are encountering it. Yeah, it's um, the body. Um, yeah, I think it's the body and it's um, the like the, the the field of vision and the um, I guess the experience of um, like I guess from a bodily experience of that experience of sight. And um, like I said, if, we're, if you're holding something like right next to your face, <laughs> um, then it feels really big. And I think when I started showing these work, works and people get close to them, but for the most part, you're standing probably at least a few feet back, you know, the, the gallery space, you know, like um, consciously or consciously where you're taught to stand back. Um, but I spent most of the time looking at it like this, <laughs> or you know maybe like with this and like this, um, and yeah, I just wanted to to see it really bigger and I to see it much bigger. Um, and then in terms of, I think there's a there's like a different intimacy in the the material on the paper and knowing that it's the let's you know seeing that it's the whole work. Um, and the materiality, and the, the, there's a yeah intimacy to that. Um, but then I think when they're so enlarged, um, yeah, it does it changes it. I feel like it kind of um, I don't know. Maybe it's more like a blanket mm -hmm. you know, that it kind of like really brings you uh, in, and you can see. Um, I mean, at least I can see all of my mistakes. <laughs> Well, that's not the mistakes, but that's sort of what I got from the, the larger pieces as well. With, with the, the embroideries on paper, or the, sorry, the coal works on paper, um, you, it's you sort of investigating what's there. You're, like you're saying, you're getting up really close and I'm um, investigating the shininess and color of every stitch. But with the larger works, they have the authority to come at you, right? There's something. Um, about them imposing is the wrong word, but coming towards you, which I find really interesting. Um, and there's a third, uh, there's a third sort of relationship that I see with your, with the body and your work, and it's um, in the performance. So, you know, you're using all of these um, natural dyes in the in the performance in the parquet, um, and they're not just coating. The, the textile that you make, you're ingesting them sometimes too, right? So it's all around you. It's not just in front of you as a sculpture, it's on you and it's within you. And I like the way that that sort of brings in this idea of like embodying a culture, embodying an identity in ways that we don't often think about or as like a viewer of, some, of your work, I wouldn't often think about. It's a really like particular way of bringing that to the, the surface. Um, yeah, and I feel like the body in general has, uh, as an idea, has run through your practice beyond the show. That's sort of how I started to learn about your work. Was um, I saw images of you sort of using the quills, and you they were pricking your fingers when you had them in your mouth, and there's this relationship to the body there um, that I found so interesting. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to touch on before I uh, open it up to the floor. If you have any questions, um, uh, and that's language. Um, you at the beginning of the tour, you talked about how um, these were two practices: learning Lenape, 
sort of runs parallel to your artistic practice, and I get the sense that they influence one another, but they don't necessarily always converge and cross. I'm wondering if you could chat about that. Yeah, I think in my um, early work, um, a lot of the pieces I made were um, trying to make sense of not um, having, you know, a, a very particular um, and often unpleasant relationship to English, you know, particularly in school, in writing, in professional life. Um, and then having there be this huge absence of my indigenous language. Um, I even had like I had teachers, you know, say things like, "It's such a shame, like you don't like speak your indigenous language. Like you'd be so much more proficient because things are oral and phonetic, and everything you struggle with is like written and spelling." And I was just like, "We have poor salt in the wound, things." <laughs> um, early 2000s, um, and yeah, I hope that at least where people are much more aware of like what it, um, those kinds of comments um, right point out, which is that um, it's entirely true, we don't speak, I don't speak my language. Um, there are um, no first speakers of Lenape um, with us anymore, there's only two um, language teachers, like Lenape language teachers in Ontario. Um, and really only a handful of people in, you know, in the world that still speak this language. Um, and, uh, you know, that's maybe do a whole other history of Manapi people and colonialism, you know, starting in the 1500s, um, and the first um, European sailor reached um, the, um, uh, Hudson River, like dipped into the estuary, um, and all the way through, you know, the removal of um, Lenape people from our homeland, where um, now the, you know, like with the reserve communities, there's two in Ontario, there's one in Wisconsin, um, in Oklahoma, um, Kansas, and um, some people who remained in uh, New Jersey. Um, right, so this is yeah, spread out community with very few um, few speakers, and um, so we they have struggled with immense grief also around that, um, and I've been so fortunate to get to begin to learn my language and begin to um, be involved in. Like to just to get to hear it um, and to be involved in language classes and learning and um, trying to keep as much of it um, as being known and spoken as possible. And um, so, the, yeah, so that's all that's happening. Um, okay, so our connection is a lot of, uh, I think anybody who makes anything, right, knows that it can be. Um, a cathartic process, it can be um, a personally transformative process, um, and um, a lot of what you know, feed work and co workers talk about is the medicine that in this process um, that it can be very um, healing um, and uh, yeah, help you with manage all of those. Um, emotions and grief. Um, so I think that's an aspect of it, of the of the making. And then there's also, um, right, the like expression. I talk a lot about how if I um, can't speak, you know, if I'm really stuck in speaking English, um, which I really resent and hate, um, then um, you know I'm so grateful that I can. Make things, right? And then that's a way that um, I can communicate with all of you, uh, you know, through all these words of talking um, back, what feels like much more um, pleasant, I guess, 
for lack of a better word, way of communicating um, is through my artwork and much more, um, yeah, the way that I would choose to express myself um, is through artwork. When I first um, was thinking about that connection and almost like trying to make that connection happen, um, I noticed that the, a lot of the, the quill works, they have a symbolic nature and even though they're not really standing in for an actual symbol or for a word or anything, they do, they communicate in that way and so that's where I found that connection. Um, the titles of the works help as well to sort of bring in that communication of something, but even when of those, you really get a sense of um, that you're communicating something within them. Like the, um, one of the ones that I really look to is Two Hoops, and I remember when I saw it in your studio, just seeing it, it looks, they look like um, hoops in space that are kind of moving, opening and closing. Um, and so even without language, they sort of are communicating in that way, which is really beautiful. Um, does, does anyone have any questions for Vanessa? About the quills. <clears throat> Is there a difference from uh, geographically from the porcupine, like down south, down east, uh, as far as the quills go? There is. Ooh, yeah, there is. Um, and I think it's really exciting. Uh, there's several subspecies of porcupine in North America. Um, and there's porcupines, different species of porcupines on the different continents. Um, that's like a good example. Okay, so this one, this piece in particular, um, I may be using the quilt, they're not dyed at all. Um, so it's like their natural, like creepy color, um, and then their natural um, dark color. And these ones, um, the, the, the part of it that's the dark color is really long. Sometimes it's a third or a half of the whole quill. Um, and there's like a nice, often a really nice gradient um, in the, um, going from the creamy part to the dark part. Um, so that's a feature of the Eastern porcupine. Um, and a Western, or Western porcupine um, in North America, the quill has a very short um, part. That's uh, that's the dark that's the dark part, and, and it's really abruptly. Um, so often with those ones, you're gonna um, that you might see a little bit of it, or it might be trimmed off entirely. Um, yeah, so those are two those are differences, and in the quills themselves, like they those are the species differences, um, and then the differences in the quills I think also happen. Uh, like in terms of what part of the body the clothes on, there's usually longer ones on the back, um, and um, the age of the porcupine. So sometimes you get one that's like quite small because it's quite young, um, and those are gonna have like thinner and smaller porcupine quills, um, and then the larger ones are just gonna have so many more quills. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to describe like. The amount of like quills that come off of a porcupine, um, but like volume is like, like again, imagine like a whole tub of work in of quills, um, and yeah, so there's like they just have like a really big variety because they they do like grow like hair, so they grow and fall off, and some of them are really thick, and some of them are super thin, and some of them are thick and short, or thin and long, or long, and it's yeah, just really big variety. So. Yeah, the different inspirations. Um, and I think the other thing that I really learned is that um, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with it. So oftentimes I'll do a bunch of drawings. I'll start to, I suppose I'll draw something and then I have to figure out like how it would work as a as will work. You know, I'd like once I look at it, I realize like, oh, I'm actually going to have to make like 10 decisions about how this one line particularly with the lettering is a great example. There would be like just, there were actually like so many different options of the way you could have, could have like split them up or like made the fold of the quills or just different even in right like to make a circle or so you could do it so many different ways. Um, and to just make two lines and be like there's so many options. Um, and <coughs> yeah and like in this like kind of 
bull lightning or mountains, um, you know, jagged lines. Um, yeah, in this piece, I think that um, because it, it, that's remaining abstract, um, I, you know, it's more fun. But then again, it was a lot of different. Um, so most of the lines meet, um, even though they're like the same colors. So thinking about. Um, there's going to be like a continuity in this line because it's the same color, uh, but to make them meet in this nice point, um, I decided to split the line here, uh, right? But at this one, it doesn't go into a point. It ends at a straight line, and the lines, right, like both come down, um, so they kind of end in this place stay in a more like rectangular form as opposed to going into a point. But all of these ones, yeah, go to point right over here, and then they meet as kind of like rectangles. Um, so yeah, lots of different choices, um, which yeah, kind of gets into the minutia <laughs> and the of the quilt work. Um, yeah, I end up um, so I usually do a lot of drawings, start to think through some of those challenges, and then um, oftentimes like a sketch will stay on my desk for like a year. Um, and then I'll but I end up with being not to be really happy, I think, with it because it's been around for so long and I'm like really considered again, they're in a sense very simple shapes. Um but I haven't really considered them for so long. I was gonna ask how how many of those decisions happen on the fly because um you know, you could, like you were saying, you could draw it out, but until you actually start to think through the process of laying down the quills, you might not realize that, oh, you have to end, you know, you have to end this line bluntly rather than to bring it and bring them together. But I guess if you have a sketch on your desk for, you know, a few months, then maybe quite a few things don't happen on the fly. They all kind of have been worked out in your mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of both. Like some, some things really get worked out and some things, it can also, like sometimes, um, it might not, like a quill will just be like a little bit short to finish the line. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, like is it, or like making making the little triangles, um, like when they go into the triangle point, um, it's really a drag when the quill is like just too short to finish the triangle point. <laughs> then you have to add a new one. Get it, get it in there. Um, so you can kind of lean into the also the um, um, like how how neat right you want it to be, um, or um, yeah, using uh, working with the different having variations in diameter, um, like diameter of the quill. I feel like you should have like a example of somebody else's quilt work. Like it really can be, a lot of people make really representational quilt work. Um, so it's like a horse, it's um, a person's face, it's um, a flower, or like, yeah, it's really representational and they get really even colors and everything lines up really perfectly. Um, You're mentioning all this, so where do you get to look at your Oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it can be it can be done. Um, but yeah, again, so I used um, like lots of different colors of yellow. Um, and so yeah, it's more representational. It's a uh, yeah, pretty pretty neat. Um, and yeah, but it's, again, in, in, in different people's style, they might use like one color yellow and then like one really solid like accent color to make it like a lot bolder. Um, yeah, and some people kind of go like, at different terms, like even further the other way and um, the poles are even like, looser and like if they don't line up together, they start to come apart the lines. Yeah. I'm just noticing um, the cicadas quill work and the Butterflies are the same, like kind of flying outwards or flying inwards. Um, 
motif, I suppose. Is there, was that conscious or did that just sort of happen? I took an online class. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. Yeah.
needle like through the paper when like the little lines are often um, uh, yeah the shadows made um, by the little bits of um, paper. Shells are carved into like cylindrical beads. 
and and um, yeah, I made one piece of work um, called Relationship or Transaction, um, and that piece is I didn't like it's uh, I didn't use wampum itself. Um, I used five dollar bills um, and made the bills into into beads and then wove um, a kind of giant wampum bottle. Um, as a